Edgerly, I hope I've pronounced that right, from Assemble Design and Architecture Collective. So if we could hear from uh, Professor Peter Head first. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's a huge pleasure to be here. And uh, uh, I'm, it's been a sort of life's work, sort of arriving today, in a way, uh, for me. Uh, uh, so it's a, it's a great subject to be here to talk about. And I want to try and make a bit of a contribution. I took this photograph in Farnham this morning, uh, crossing the little bridge in Meadow Park, it's called, I think. And I thought that was a rather nice thing to see on the way to a conference about extinction. Um, so I'm gonna, we're going to talk about te technology and long-term survival and how the two can be married up. I'm going to talk a little bit about the global instability, which most of you are here because you know about it. I'm going to talk about what's going on in the world, so try and address it. I'm going to talk about what I'm trying to do, which is to turn data observatories into collaboratories for action that might change things and then how that might lead to human and ecological resilience. And then I'm going to talk about demonstrators because I'm practical and we want to actually demonstrate this. So what's going on in the world? Our world is a, is a planet which um, obviously sits in the solar system and it's pretty much self-contained apart from the sunlight that falls on it and the odd asteroid which we have to try and deflect if we can uh, for resilience. Um, but basically what we're doing, which is why we're all here, is that we've created the industrial model of development pretty much in the UK. It's now being used all over the world. And it says success is growing GDP, it's growing money supply, it's growing money, and we don't care if the ecosystem has been killed in the process. And clearly human well-being and resilience is going to suffer terribly unless we do something about it. So we have to do something. In addition to that, 100 years ago, we had about eight hectares of land to support everyone's life, but because of population growth, we've now only got about two hectares of land to support, to provide our water, to provide our food, and so on. And that clearly, population growth is putting huge pressure on, on, on land and ecology. And in very practical terms, in China, the, urban, the, the incredible rate of urbanization means that the ecological footprint, which is one way of calculating the amount of land we need, not the only way, uh, is growing about 4% a year. That means 4% times 1.3 billion people times 2.3 hectares per person, which is where they're at at the moment, it's about 100 million hectares uh, of land they have to find every year to support urbanization, which is why China's in, you know, everywhere else in the world trying to find the resources, and they know that's not sustainable. This cannot go on. So if you think that China's urbanization is going to carry on for another 15 to 20 years, it cannot go on because they can't find the resources to drive it. <coughs> so what is the world doing about the understanding of these issues? Well, the first thing that's happening, and this is really, really important, is that the United Nations are creating 10, probably 10 sustainable development goals for the world to follow, which will replace the Millennium Development Goals. And I'm involved in that process with Columbia University and Jeff Sachs on the urban dimension. There's a tremendous amount of work being done. So if you really want to understand the evidence base for a lot of thinking, go onto their website, because there's a lot of good science evidence base behind those goals. And two of them are ecosystems goals. I think they'll probably be collapsed into one. But there is an ecosystems goal in there for the first time uh, in terms of going forwards. China has realized this for some time. So when the new president came in, he made two changes to China's constitution. One was that they should take a scientific approach to development, which means that you measure things and, and actually understand what you're doing. And the other legal requirement is to make ecological progress. This is China's con legal constitution, is to make ecological progress. Two weeks ago, they started, uh, created an environmental court, and they also have circular economy law uh, to actually help manage materials better. In China, uh, making ecological progress is something they, they've been doing for a while. This is the Upper Lers Plateau in China, and this is a 10-year time-lapse film of transformation of the Upper Lers Plateau in China from a barren 
uh, deforested place to a place that's now vibrant, grows food, uh, water's come back with through agroforestry, over 20,000 square kilometers. Uh, China's forestry has increased by 1% of the land area over the last uh, 30 years. So, uh, and this is all done by local people. And, and so I, I think this is a profoundly exciting demonstration that we can encourage ecology back into vibrancy. And that's why I called my trust, my charity, the Ecological Sequestration Trust, because I believe the natural systems are the secret to, to human life being more resilient. So it is all about food, it's about raw materials, it's about energy, it's about water, and it's the same thing for natural systems as people, basically. Those things are, are important for all natural systems. So we have to understand those systems, and uh, one thing that we have now realised, and a lot of businesses have realised, is that the circular economy is one way of taking a stepping stone towards reducing pollution, using materials uh, in, in cycles, uh, and, and basically improving air, water and soil quality and improving soils particularly. And this report from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation is a very good one. So I think there's a general understanding, and Joe will, will talk about this too, that, that the regional approach, the urban-rural connection regional approach, is probably where we can make the biggest difference most quickly. And, and this is about gathering data, knowledge, embedding it in planning, and uniting economic, social, and environmental metrics and understandings in a collaborative way. And that's very much what I believe in and what we're trying to demonstrate. Now, the problem is that we have to move, run very fast here. Uh, most people think we've got to make a big change in the next 10 to 15 years if we're really going to stop a lot of destruction. And, and Gandhi said there's no point in running fast unless you're running in the right direction. And the big problem is that we don't know where to run. So what I'm trying to do uh, is create a resilience compass for human and ecological resilience to enable communities to discover for themselves what these solutions are and to learn from each other. And, and so imagine a website, and this is what we're hoping to create within about 18 months. Imagine a website where you can spin the, the globe. You can then go to any region that you're interested in actually go there you can draw a red line around your region and you can sign a sign a form and download a platform which is a human ecological systems uh, economics platform uh, and you can get access to apps to help you use that platform if you want to but you don't have to and it'll be free at end of use and it will enable you to create a platform that gives you an understanding of ecological systems, of human systems, and, and geology, uh, and how it all interacts uh, as a complete system um, with, with data loaded in either automatically from satellites or uh, by crowdsourcing. And the reason this is possible today is two very fundamental things. One reason why this is now possible and it's never been possible before is that we have satellites circling the Earth which now take photographs of every piece of land on Earth, including the ecology, every day. And that is provided mostly free for use by communities, except they don't know it's there and they don't know how to use it. So that information is beamed down to land-based receivers and we're going to make sure it's available free uh, at, uh, for communities. At the same time, this information is being used to create a digital earth simulator, uh, which is bringing together all of the earth systems models. And so our resilience.io regional uh, collaborative platform is going to be designed to talk to the earth system simulator so that climate variations and other things can be fed back to the region and the region can talk to the, the global. And we hope this open source platform will become ubiquitously used on the planet to help manage soils better, manage agriculture better, manage forestry better. The Earth Simulator is being developed by the Institute, uh, sorry, the International Centre for Earth Simulation in Geneva. And they're doing what I'm doing, which is bringing together world leading modelers and experts in all the different areas to, to actually create an integrated collaborative approach which is at the leading edge of current understanding. 
One of the reasons why this can be used is that over the last uh, 20 years or so, we've got 1 billion internet users, we've got a population of some 6 billion mobile phones. So the idea is that these platforms, which will be highly intuitive to use, not very technical hopefully, can be used by, through mobile devices, through kids with, with, uh, at school, through students at university, through businesses. So it's a very intuitive and easy to use understanding of, of, of the place and the reason that this can be done is because we've got the most incredible processing capability in the world now to enable us to, to tackle what you might think is a ferociously difficult problem but actually it can be tackled now that's, and that's the point. So basically communities can be connected directly to their local regional platform and uh, the mayor of Rio wants to put this platform into Rio Head of the Olympics in 2016, which is a bit of a challenge, but but we are hoping to do that so that people in the favelas can feel they have some ownership of the way forward for their city for the first time, uh, and the mayor is very keen to try and do that. The thing we're bringing to this, because most of what I've told you already is sort of that exists, but what we're doing, which is different, is we're creating a systems model that integrates human well-being economics and ecological systems into a single model. So we're creating the algorithm links between those things, which I'll show you in a minute. So this slide is the essence of what we're bringing to this, which is different. So what we're doing is we're saying if ecological health improves and air quality, water quality and soil quality improves for ecology, that means that human health also improves, which means that health costs and economic benefits arise because health costs are lower, and that includes mental health, of course. Uh, it also means people are more productive, which actually also means that the economy benefits and the model enables you to see that, and it also enables you to see what training and education and skills are needed. And it also links asset values to the value of of properties and where they sit, whether they're next to parks or good schools or, or rivers and so on. Uh, and, and all of that runs through into a platform to enable us to design and produce um, ideas. How is this possible? Well, it's possible because we brought together world-leading city resource modelers, world-leading uh, forestry modelers, the European Forestry Institute models, world-leading soil and agriculture and nutrient cycling and carbon cycling models, uh, the profile model at Lund University in Sweden, and the only people in the world who I've discovered understand how to do this value economics properly, and that's the Institute for Integrating Economics Research in Zurich. I brought them all together and said, will you bring your existing models together, integrate them, and give it to the world? And amazingly, they said yes, which was quite a breakthrough because they may not have said yes to giving it to the world. So basically, without going into the technology, you can see you can pull data into these various layers, crowdsource, mobile phone data for mobility. The model will produce these resource flow diagrams, um, and you can plug in your service networks and other things from the utility companies uh, to use it. So it means that this sort of transformation that was done in Seoul, in Korea, where this road was taken out, Placed with a river and walking and cycling for people, actually was an economics project, but of course the mayor didn't have a model to prove it, he just did it because he felt that taking the road out and removing pollution and noise was a good thing to do. And of course the economics did work out. Well, this platform would enable this sort of transformation to happen uh, in, in cities uh, because the model would tell you it's a good idea. So where does culture and art fit into this? Well, when I started this journey, I suppose 15 years ago, I, I was very clear in my mind that art, art and culture have to come into this because if these platforms are going to be trusted and used, the art and culture community has to work with communities with these platforms to actually test and, and, and question and, and, and all those things. So I created an organization called Culture Futures, which now operates globally, which connects art and culture into the change process. And I also believe that uh, most people object to change because of a loss of memory of the past, and therefore to actually embed the cultural history of a place in the platform to enable people to be much more confident about the journey moving forward is really important. So we've done loads of events, and this one was actually at COP17 in Durban, and the 
lady standing there is Ella Gandhi, who's uh, Mahatma Gandhi's granddaughter. And I had the wonderful experience of her saying after Al Lorraine that if he'd been alive, he'd have loved what you were doing. So that's partly why I used the reference earlier. Um, she's a wonderful person and uh, really, really thought what we were doing was good. So cultural planning is a discipline that we developed in Arab, and basically it, it does involve taking philosophy, literature and art, education, psychology, history, religion, anthropology, sociology, ecology and biology, and bringing all these disciplines into the process of building trust and understanding of the way forward. And, and this has to actually come into the process, and unless we do that, I don't believe the trust will ever be built if it's just based on science and technology. So basically the platform is intended to be used outside government, it's intended to be used maybe under the control of the social enterprise to create a collaborative tool where people still work in their silos but they work using an integrated platform that I believe will build collaborative intelligence and I know that Joe and I were discussing this earlier, I think it's a really important concept that the level of human understanding and consciousness about what we're doing to the planet can be lifted to a completely new level if we have trusted tools. And that will include policy and economics, include taxation, incentivization, and so on and so forth. This sort of collaboration using uh, data tools is already here and now. In Europe, there's an Inspire Open Data program running. The Dutch government have picked this up and create, uh, they, they've now created practical tools for integrated planning using resource data from the Inspire program. But this doesn't contain social and economic understanding. So what we're doing is adding to this the social and economic outcomes and the ecology outcomes, which, which clearly are needed if this is going to be successful. So in terms of using this platform, financing is really important. We've got to be able to finance change properly. And so the really big transformative step with the platform is to use it for performance-based procurement. If we do low, lowest first cost procurement, then this isn't going to work. But the platform will be designed to enable performance-based procurement using the platform to be used. So you use the platform to either say, for a given price, you have to maximize the social, economic, and environmental outcomes, or you have to maximize the, um, uh, you have to give a, give a variable price for a given set of outcomes. Either, but every piece of procurement in the region has to follow that process with the platform and if you do that there will be a regional investment fund available for linked to the platform that will enable you to draw capital down into the projects that deliver what the investment fund is looking for. So the pension funds and others are, are ready and waiting to do this. They are, are actually very excited about it. Uh, this is just the first step in the process but I genuinely believe that at least this is a way we could start to make this transformation happen. I'm very practical, so I want to do it in demonstration regions. So we've already agreed with the Chinese government that we're going to do it in one demonstration region in, in, in the city of Tianjin in China. The Mongolian uh, government wants to use this for trying to uh, arrest deforestation in, in the grasslands in Mongolia and, and in Ulaanbaatar. Uh, DFID uh, are going to put this platform into four regions of Africa. Um, probably in Ghana, Ethiopia, Nigeria, and the DRC. And the mayor of Rio wants to use it in Rio. And we have, through a very tortuous process, arrived at the demonstration region of Dorset, which isn't exactly the place you might have expected us to be doing this. But I had to go somewhere where there's some leadership. And Dorset and Bournemouth have adopted the Earth Charter and therefore seem to be very interested in taking it forward. So to finish... Um, Basically, we're going to try and use this for human and ecological resilience. Uh, and uh, what I'd like to say to you at UCA is I'd love you to be involved in this. I'd love the initiative you've taken here to carry on through these demonstration projects. So bring your, your art and culture and ideas into, into the demonstration region in Dorset to start with, but also um, help us globally through, through the Culture Futures Network to, to see what we can do. I'm not claiming this is the answer to everything. I'm just saying that this is a possible way forward, which may be helpful. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Peter. That was really amazing. Um, that's kind of opened up uh, some really interesting issues for everyone. Can we take um, a couple of questions from the delegates? Um, Melissa is going to pass around the microphone. She's got one over there. Uh, who would like to ask Peter a question? Michael. Could you expand a bit on, on what you said about people often object to change because of a loss of memory of the past? Yes, I could. I give you, I, if, if you don't mind me giving you an example. Um, we, we, when I was in Arab, we worked on planning of, uh, uh, of redevelopment of an airfield northeast of Cambridge. And the government had been trying to get the planning approved by local villagers who said, we don't want stuff built on this lovely green old airfield used in the war. Um, and they objected to everything. So we were brought in to say, can you help? <coughs> can you do something better? So what, what our master planners did was they reflected the, the, the history of the airfield. So they took the edge of the old grass airstrip and the little road around the barrack block and things, and they reflected that in the master plan. So it was actually in there. You could still see it. And when this was presented to the villagers, um, the usual suspects were very quiet. They didn't say anything. So the government said to them, what, what are you thinking? And they said, well, actually, we hate to say this, but we actually like this master plan. And <laughs> everyone fell over. And, and, and they said, we hadn't realized until we saw this that the reason we've been objecting is the loss of memory of the airfield. Because these villages, all of the families married airmen during the war. There was a whole cultural history of, of, of that airfield. And we thought we were going to lose that memory, that it would be wiped out. And actually, now we see it. We, we, you know, the memory's there, and we're going to move forward. So that, that's just why I've got loads of examples, but that's one. Thank you. Anyone else have a question? Hello. I just wanted to um, ask you about um, your um, demonstration and reading on, on your doorstep, because I was really pleased to see with your presentation that, that you were seeing that the country is really integral to what you're doing. But I just wanted to ask what sort of things are you thinking about doing there? Are you looking at certain areas where you sit, um, looking at whether art might get involved. Yeah, well, yeah, it, it's, uh, we're, we're right in the thick of it. So on the 19th of June, we have a workshop with local communities and local people to really engage people and discover the answer to your question, because it's not up to us to decide. We will deploy the platform for the whole of Dorset, so it will, it will model the whole of Dorset. We'll end up with a three-dimensional visualisation of Dorset, the whole of Dorset, and, and an understanding of all the resource systems and flows and all the stupid things that are happening, and the, the lack of linkage between ag agriculture, forestry, and human living, and sort of where the ecology is going, and also the sea as well, which I'm part of it. So, um, so on the 19th of June, we'll be doing that. If anyone here wants to come and be involved in that workshop, we'd be very welcome. And, and if you want to come and bring some, some art and um, a little bit of performance even to it, we'd, we'd welcome actually, because we're still developing, even though it's fairly late, developing that. And after that workshop, if they decide to go ahead, we've actually got a way of funding the whole thing to take it forward. Um, so, um, so yeah, we're open to rotation. Please, let, let's follow it up. Thank you. And what is the timescale for making this sort of into this rotating paradise? <laughs> well, it, it, the, the timescale is whatever pe local people do, because it's, it's their place, you know. For them, if they want to turn it into a utopian place, they can. So this is very much up to them, really. But they'll have a they'll have a platform that enables them to see how to do it. That's what we hope. Uh, it'll take ten years, maybe, uh, to really transform it. But ten years is not that long. Um, but if it does transform inside ten years, and the rest of the world sees that, then it may well follow suit. We we actually have a way of scaling this up. Um, I, I talked to the World Bank in China and said to them, if the first demonstration is successful, will you create a revolving fund that provides loans to put the platform into a new region? And then the region pay the money back after six or seven years out of the benefits that accrue. And they, in principle, said that they'll do that. So I said to them, does that mean you <coughs> uh, would you be willing to uh, fund 500 to 1,000 cities in China to, to, to roll this platform out? They said, yeah, in principle. Yeah. So, we could use a revolving fund to scale it up um, because clearly people won't do it unless they've got the money to set it all up. But the value propositions that come from it are fantastically strong, as I'm sure most of you realise. So 
So, you know, three or four million to set it up is not very much compared with what the benefits would come back. So it's trying to trying to break that link. So so I think I th we're hoping this will scale very quickly, scale very quickly across Europe as well. Just one more question. At the beginning of your talk, you touched on something that I think is very important, and it was the, the relationship between population and land available. Yeah. And um, whereas I hear successive governments talking about the need to continuously provide new housing, I don't really talk about, I don't hear anyone in power talking about population control or the problem of population. And it's sort of a dirty word almost. I wondered how you felt as someone as involved as you are? Well, I, th I, think, I think it is an issue for the longer term, but actually, the, the, you know, the, if you look at the demographic, you know, if you go to experts on this subject, they, they reckon that actually the population is going to peak you know, pretty much on the current trajectory. Um, because as people get richer, they, they have less children generally around the world, actually. And also, a little bit of education has been tr quite transformative. I don't know if you know what's happened in some parts of the world where education programs have been put in place, population growth has, has gone down by a factor of three in about 10 years in some countries. So actually, I, I, I actually think with platforms like this and an understanding of, of the, you know, the problems of, of intensity and, and you know, that people will realize that having large families is not such a great idea for, for, the, for the resilience of their own kids and so on. So I'm, I'm sort of reasonably optimistic, actually, from the evidence I have that a population will peak at 9 to 10 billion, uh, but also that these types of platforms will help people understand that connection better. Because I think in the end, it, it, it's the consciousness of the issue that's critical, in my mind anyway, the consciousness of the value of ecology, the consciousness of the pressure on the planet. And, and I hope that platforms like this will do that. Okay, thank you very much.